This unit of study, we're going to cover the emergence of the market economy, 1815 to 1850. And this is mostly in the regional area, or mostly of the north, maybe a little bit of the south. After finishing this unit of study, the U.S. history student should be able to answer these following focus questions. One, how did changes in transportation and communication alter the economic landscape during the first half of the 19th century? Two, how did industrial development impact the way people worked and lived? Three, in what ways did immigration alter the nation's population? and shape its politics? And four, how did the expanding market-based economy impact the lives of workers, professionals, and women? The Market Revolution. During Jefferson's embargo and the War of 1812, Americans were forced to look to themselves for the finished products and manufactured items they needed. In the 18th century, most families engaged in subsistence agriculture. That means they just grew enough to feed themselves. In the 19th century, more farm families engaged in commercial agriculture. As the 19th century unfolded, more and more farm families began engaging in commercial rather than subsistence agriculture, producing surplus crops and livestock to sell in distant markets. Internal improvements increased the flow of these goods. Thus, the spark of the Industrial Revolution was struck. And with this new demand for goods came a new need for more efficient ways to get them to market. Thus, paved and well-maintained roads were seen as a necessary commodity for the government to provide. In addition, the advent of steam technology applied to boats increased the demand for safe and deep waterways to move goods and people to their destination. Junctions of the North and Western Canals in 1825 and acquaint by John Hill. The construction of the Erie Canal promoted by the governor of New York was a great feat located in central New York. It connected the Great Lakes and the Midwest to the Hudson River and New York City. Thomas Jefferson called this construction little short of madness. Indeed, it came to be the longest canal in the world covering more than 363 miles. Thousands of workers, mostly German and Irish immigrants, were responsible for carrying out the building of this engineering marvel. However, they were paid very little and less than a dollar per day. In 1825, the early canal opened and brought much of its Midwestern trade, such as furs, textiles, and lumber to the east. Previously, such goods had needed to be transported to Canada or via the Mississippi and Ohio rivers to the Gulf of Mexico. The cost of moving a ton of freight, moreover, was greatly reduced due to the canal. In only a matter of seven years, the money pouring in as a result of the canal paid off all this cost of its construction. Steamboats. Here we see a picture of steamboats at a levee in St. Paul, Minnesota in 1859. In 1807, Robert Fulton, and Robert R. Livingston sent the Claremont up the Hudson River from New York. It was the first commercial steamboat that made it possible to get back up river. This was significant because flat boats, conversely, had been able to travel in just one direction, downstream. The use of wood-fired steamboats quickly became more prominent along major rivers and nearly half the continent experienced water traffic. A transcontinental market emerged as a result of a two-way travel to the Mississippi Valley that steamboats had enabled. Another effect was the rise of commercial agricultural empire, including the production of cotton, timber, wheat, corn, cattle, and hogs. As the number of steamboats in the American rivers rose, there were 750 by 1836. The cost of shipping goods fell drastically. Profits and demand increased in return. At the same time, there were also risks associated with steamboats. Often they experienced accidents, explosions, and fires. Sanitation was also bad. 
Now, here is why the Erie Canal was so vital and so important. So here we see New York City located here. New York City is dead center of the American coastline where the Erie Canal that is linking Lake Erie all the way to the Hudson River, this brings all this traffic of Lake Erie from places like Detroit, Toledo, and even Cleveland, Ohio, as well as everything else into the fact that it could now go through the Erie Canal to New York. Trade coming from Europe hitting New York can now carry to this area of the Ohio Valley and other areas. This will make New York the most powerful economic city on the eastern seaboard. Railroads. Railroads were the last and the most important transportation improvement that had spurred economic development in Jacksonian America. Peter Cooper built the first efficient steam locomotives in 1830, known as the Tom Thumb for the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, the first railroad built in America, you know, the B&O Railroad from Monopoly. The last arrival of the three main modes of transportation, construction of the railroad started in port towns, but ignited a building epidemic throughout the nation, being less expensive to build and maintain than canals. Railroads quickly surpassed them as a primary method of shipping. Railroads also spurred internal settlements in places where they would have to stop and refuel. Ocean transportation, the clipper ships. Using the latest in technology, clipper ships transformed shipping between the continents, doubling the speed of their predecessors. These new ships were able to ship goods between ports so quickly that perishable items like tea could be imported before spoiling. These were also known as the tall ships. These are the big ocean going greyhounds with a huge number of sails. And actually, the record to go from New York to Sacramento, California, around the Horn, was done in 89 days by the Cuddy Sark. Such increases in the infrastructure of the United States required substantial amounts of money, a need that was filled by private investors, state governments, and later by the federal government. This was done primarily through the purchase of stock in various companies. But as these maps indicate and show how railroad growth just exploded on the scene. Now what is interesting to know is that the railroads were not the same gauge. That means width. So a train could not travel, let's say, from New York all the way to Chicago unless it was that one line. But we could see how railroads exploded by 1850. I also should note is that where most of the railroads are located, such as here in the Northeast and also here in the Midwest. Because of the railroads located in this area, this is gonna give the North the advantage when it comes to industrialization. Despite what you see in the railroads in the South are very meager and very small in between. Communication. Mail delivery improvement, the number of post offices went from 75 in 1790 to 28,498 by 1860. Within the introduction of the steam powered printing press, now there was mass production of newspapers, reducing the cost from six cents to a mere penny. Express delivery service named Wells Fargo began in 1852. Wells Fargo joined other express companies to form the Overland Mail Company, which gave twice a week mail service between St. Louis and San Francisco, California. Before that, it was twice a month by steamship. In 1860, the Pony Express Company was founded to deliver mail between St. Joseph, Missouri in Sacramento, California. Riders changed horses every 10 to 15 miles. The fastest to go from St. Louis, Missouri to Sacramento was eight days. Telegraph system. In much the same way, the Americans were able to look inward to meet the needs of their newly burgeoning markets in the way of transportation, they were also able to do so for communications. The most important advance in communication was the National Electromagnetic Telegraph System, 
invented by Samuel F. B. Morse in 1944. Morse sent his first telegram message from Washington, D.C. to Baltimore, and it read, What hath God wrought? But it would sound like, It was a series of dots and dashes, hence Morse code. The telegram helped railroad operators schedule trains more precisely to avoid collisions and also put the Pony Express out of business. The role of government. State governments, as well as private investors, funded developments in transportation. Although at times there was heated political debates regarding the constitutionality of using federal funds for such purposes, the federal government also played a role in the financing of such improvements. The national government purchased stock in turnpike and canal companies, land grants to a large number of western states to aid the development of canals and railroads were also among the national government's contributions. State and national governments played active roles in the transportation revolution. States provided money and the national government supplied land and other services. Half of all the capital for early railroads came from state governments. The court system also support of corporate rights to intimate domain meant that corporations could purchase rights away on land whenever they needed. In the Supreme Court decision of Gibbons v. Ogden, the Supreme Court in 1824 looked at involving coastal commerce that overturned a steamboat monopoly granted by the state of New York on grounds that only Congress had the authority to regulate interstate commerce. States could not restrict trade within their jurisdiction. In the Supreme Court case Charles River Bridge, v. Warren Bridge in 1837, Chief Justice Roger B. Taney, the new Supreme Court Chief Justice who replaced John Marshall's decision, came when the Commonwealth of Massachusetts sanctioned another company to build the Warren Bridge in 1828 that would be very close in proximity to the first bridge and would connect the two cities. The proprietors of the Charles River Bridge claimed that Massachusetts legislature had broken its contract with the Charles River Bridge Company, and thus the contract clause in the, in the Constitution had been violated. The owners of the first bridge claimed that the charter had also implied exclusive rights to the Charles River Bridge Company. The court ultimately sided with Warren Bridge, this decision was received with very mixed opinions and had some impact on the remainder of Taney's tenure as Chief Justice. Contrary to the previous rulings of Fletcher v. Pact and Gibbons v. Ogden, the Dartmouth College cases, Taney ruled that the object of the government was to promote the general happiness of the country's citizens and responsibility took precedence over the rights of contract and property. That promotional economic competition by ruling that had broader rights to the community took precedence over any presumed right of a monopoly granted by a corporate charter. Industrial Development American Technology Practical inventiveness made development of new technologies possible. Between the years of 1790 and 1811, the U.S. Patent Office approved an annual average of 77 patents certifying new inventions. This number grew to tens of thousands of new inventions each year by the 1850s. Steam engines and the new technologies led to industrialization in Europe and America. And throughout the mid-1800s, the life of Americans was transformed through the invention of the telegraph, the sewing machine, and the vulcanization of rubber. Elias Howe created a design of the sewing machine and patented it in 1846. Isaac Merritt Singer soon became an even better design and started the Singer Sewing Machine Company. In the beginning, its sewing machines were only meant to be used in textile mills. In time, though, it offered machines that could be used inside the home as well. Women's work also changed as a result the time needed to make clothes decrease and therefore allow women to spend more time on other activities, including the leisurely variety. The impact of the cotton gin. Eli Whitney's drawing, which accommodated his 
1794 Federal Patent Application shows the side and the top of the machine, as well as the saw teeth that separated the seeds from the cotton fiber. After the 1790s, cotton production is going to boom. While cotton required a significant amount of labor, slaves also cultivated corn and performed other tasks. It was cotton that revitalized the institution of slavery. In 1793, Eli Whitney would invent the cotton engine, or gin. This is after he returned from visiting friends in Savannah and noticed how long it took slaves to separate the seed from the cotton balls. His cotton gin would boom the industry, allowing cotton industry to grow. Louisiana would be admitted to the Union in 1812, Texas and Florida in 1845. Because the cotton gin, the cost of producing cotton plunged 90%. The textile mills created a growing global market for southern cotton. Britain preferred the American grow cotton over cotton grown in Brazil and India, and the demand for southern cotton skyrocketed. By 1860, British textile mills were producing a billion pounds a year, 92% came from American Southern cotton. Tennessee, Alabama, Florida, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Texas emerged as new cotton growing regions. New Orleans was a bustling port for the active slave market due to the cotton growth. Bankers in New York City and London financed the growth of global cotton capitalism. The South was producing two-thirds of the world's supply of cotton, as well as sugar, rice, and tobacco, hence King Cotton. Due to the relentless years of tobacco farming, farmland in Maryland and Virginia shifted from growing corn and wheat, but the area was too cold for cotton. So they sold their surplus slaves to work in Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Florida. As a result, the price in slaves also increased. Cotton created a boom in the Old Southwest, and between 1790 and 1860, some 835,000 slaves were sold south. Farming in the Midwest. By the early 1800s, land was scarce in the East, especially New England, and land was even more productive and expensive in the Middle Atlantic states. In the South, planters controlled the best lands to cultivate cotton. Overproduction of farmland in the East began to drain the soil as the nutrients necessary to grow crops. This, coupled with cheap land in the West and the economic panic of 1819, caused many a farmer to move West to start over. The number of settlers in the Old Northwest rose tenfold between 1810 and 1840. Migration belts tended to move east to west, maintaining the same north-south cultural difference that existed along the Atlantic coastline. Usually corn was the first crop grown after the clearing of land, and women, as well as children, played a vital role in planting the seeds in the tiny mounds that had approximately three feet between them. Following the sprouting of the corn, these types of seeds would be planted around the corn seedlings, resulting in pumpkin, squash, or beans. Wheat became the major cash crop in the North America and contributed to the Northern manufacturing. Westerners promoted industrialization in the East by providing food for the growing workforce in the East. Wisconsin was the last one to gain statehood in the Old Northwest Territory. The illustration you see before you appeared in the catalog of the Great Expedition held at the Crystal Palace in London in 1851. The plow eased the transformation of rough plains into fertile farmland and rapid machine accelerated farm production. Other technological advances, including Jethro Wood's iron plow in 1819 and John Deere's steel plow in 1837, followed up by McCormick's Reaper. The population density, 1820 and 1860. The region we see that has the greatest amount of population 
density is New England and part of the northern Atlantic states. These changes in the land, of course, encouraged western expansion that we went over previously and caused the price of land to decrease between 1840, therefore brings a development of migration from the east to the west. Still, mostly, as we can see, is concentrated mostly in the Midwestern region. The southern region, not a lot due to few uh, plantation owners controlling the better part of the land. The Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution was a period of the increased output of goods made by machine and new inventions, the way the work was done. From 1760 to 1840, one invention after another saw more changes in their lifetime than 10 generations before. The industrialization of process and development machine production of goods caused suffering, though. First came the scientific agriculture revolution. Technological advancements helped spur agricultural growth and the development of a national and international marketplace kept records and they used to compare and contrast. Charles Townsend with crop rotation, plant wheat and barley, and then next year turnips. Livestock breeding allowed only the best animals to breed and increase the size and their weight. Cloth production, wool, linen, and cotton. Cotton is light and durable and demand for cotton is high and profits could be made if only one could speed up the work. Here came these new inventions. Other changes that had a greater impact on the economy, the financiers and creators of the earliest factories were the industrial capitalists, were major players in the shifting characterization of 19th century. Britain had the advantage over the United States and other countries, beginning with the flying shuttle, spinning jenny, and water mule, which increased production. The steam engine's invention in 1705, and then later on, James Watt improved it in 1765. And the additional inventions came the mechanization of the process of textiles. But England wanted to keep all these things secret. Anyone who had any kind of knowledge of these machines were not allowed to travel outside of Great Britain. Coal power. The shift from water to coal as an energy source initiated a worldwide industrial era. Samuel Slater. As said before, Britain kept much of his industrial knowledge secret. For example, it sought hard to prevent the export of machines or the publication of descriptions of them, yet such precautions could only do so much. Samuel Slater brought a plan with him to America for water-powered spinning machines. He had memorized them and comes in with contact with Moses Brown. Together, they build the first mill in Potoctic, Rhode Island. This system was called the putting out system systems of manufacturing in which merchants furnished households with raw materials for processing for family farms and created a business of relationship between merchants and household artisans, a skilled craftsman who could make things by hand. That's an artisan. The financiers and creators of the early factories, the industrial capitalists, were major players in the shifts of characterization of the 19th century. Britain, of course, had the advantage. In 1800, one-sixth of American production went to Britain. By 1860, one-third, and by 1880, two-thirds. After the War of 1812, Britain would flood the market with cheap cotton cloth. Tariffs. New England mill owners lobbied for protective federal tariffs or taxes, and shippers were against the tariff because it reduced the amount of cargo. In 1860, the tariff bill was passed. It passed a 25 cents on every yard of imported cloth. This would help the mills to dominate the national marketplace. The Lowell system. The various labor systems are going to be developed in the textile industry. First is the Rock Island system. During the industrialization of the early 19th century, the recruitment of entire families, including the use of children as laborers in mills. Although mill work initially provided women 
with an opportunity for independence and education, conditions soon deteriorated as profits took precedence. The Waltham system during the industrialization of the 19th century with the recruitment of unmarried young women for employment in factories. And Lowell, Massachusetts was based on this system of the Waltham system. With the growth of massive factories required large number of workers. And soon after a factory was established, a city would be built around it. The Lowell system of mills involved placing under one roof the entire weaving process powered by a nearby river. Workers in the mills were primarily young women, 15 to 30 years of age. Many had been selected due to their ability to use textile machines. They are paid $2.50 per week, lower than men for the same work, and these women still had made the highest wages compared to the rest of the women in the world during the period. But they also had to have mandatory church attendance, strict curfews, long hours, low wages, and live in a dormitory. Industrialization in cities. Conflicts between native-born mill workers and owners nevertheless occurred. Mill owners increasingly came to hire Irish immigrants who accepted lower wages. Mills and factories gradually transformed the New England landscape in the early 19th century. A textile mill established during the embargo of 1807, the union manufacturers would eventually employ more than 600 people. But the output of industrialization, since it's based on steam and coal burning engines would produce large amounts of soot and areas become grimy and dirty as more and more people were flocking for the opportunity to work in these factories. New York City. New York's economy and industry, like those of many other cities, grew rapidly in the early 19th century. The proportion of urban to rural populations rose from 3% to 16% between the years 1790 and 1860. New York City came to surpass all the other cities in its growth. It was the first city to have more than 1 million people. A key cause of this was, of course, its natural harbor and its access to the Erie Canal. Still, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Boston had continued to be among the largest cities, also due to the role in the Atlantic seaports. New Orleans' use of a site for shipping items via the Mississippi River made it the nation's fifth largest city. Growth of cities of 1820. In the early 1800s, the largest American cities were on the Atlantic port, such as New York, Philadelphia, Boston, and Baltimore. All grew as a result of the transportation revolution. The growth in New York City was fueled, of course, by the following factors, increasing the flow of food from the west into the city, and the possession of the finest harbor on the east coast, and the construction of the Erie Canal. Growth of the cities continued in the 1860s. Inland port cities at St. Louis, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Detroit, and Chicago also emerged as important urban centers. The Great Lake ports of Buffalo, Cleveland, Milwaukee, Detroit, and Chicago, and the new industrial towns such as Pittsburgh were the fastest growing cities. Pittsburgh complemented its function as an exchange center by developing a significant manufacturing sector. Cincinnati was known as Porkopolis because of its early meat packing center, and St. Louis was ideally located for urban growth because of its location on the Mississippi and Missouri rivers. Popular culture. In rural areas, communal activities remain popular. Blood sports emerge as popular urban entertainment for men of all social classes. Blood sports being like mostly boxing, which was just bare fists and people would box each other until basically one person had given up. Other popular sports included cockfighting and dogfighting, and during the 1830s, boxing became a popular form of entertainment. Taverns and saloons also sprang up to meet the desire for the social drinker. Theaters still provided the primary outlet for American entertainment, 
respectable women seldom went to the cult of domesticity of the time, limited their experiences outside of the home. The performing arts, theaters, opera houses, playhouses, and music halls attracted mostly male audiences. The Crow Quadrilles. The sheet music you see on there is the cover printed in 1837 shows eight vignettes, caricatures, African Americans, minstrel shows. These were white people in black face and shows enjoyed nationwide popularity while reinforcing racial stereotypes. Between the 1830s and 1870s, many enjoyed minstrel shows more than anyone northern working class ethnic groups and southern whites. White composer Stephen Foster's many popular songs maintained the further spread of the sentiment myth of contented slaves. Immigration. European turmoil during the first part of the 19th century of the Napoleonic Wars that ended in 1815 contributed to a major influx of immigrants to the United States. Then came European nationalists in 1848, believed that the time had come to sweep away the old fashioned empires and replace them with nation states. Starting in January of 1848 in the Kingdom of Two Sicilies. In four months, there are gonna be 50 revolts all across Europe. Germans wanted a unified nation. Only Great Britain and Russia are the only two European countries that were not affected by the revolutions of 1848. And in 1845 to 1854, had the greatest proportional of influx of immigrants in US history. They are trying to escape the chaos. Nearly 3 million immigrants, about 15% of the total 1845 US population were immigrants. The Irish and the Germans, bar none, were the largest number of immigrants between 1840 and 1860. Irish immigration. In 1845, the Irish potato famine emerged due to a fungus that had ruined the potato crop. Almost one million people perished. Almost two million Irishmen left their country out of desperation mainly traveling to Canada and the United States. This is out of a population that was only 4 million. This is sometimes referred to as a Holocaust in itself, due to the British landowners who owned the land in Ireland, refusing to let out their grain that would feed the starving Irish. Irish were found dead along roadside with their mouths green because they were forced to try to eat grass just to try to survive. The majority of the Irish that came over were Roman Catholic, with an average age in their early 20s. The Irish came to compromise over half the population of Boston and New York City. Their living conditions were poor, with most living in tenement apartment houses. Crime, disease, alcoholism, and prostitution were prevalent in Irish neighborhoods. All major cities saw the emergence of anti-Catholic and anti Irish publications. At the same time, Irish Americans often showed ill will towards other groups. Free African Americans, for example, competed with them for the low wage jobs, which contributed to such a sentiment. What you see there before you is a Thomas Nass cartoon of the Irish, who you can see was not very favorable. His Irish usually are drawn to look like monkeys and always carrying. Uh, any kind of whiskey or alcohol. Compared to Irish immigration, German immigrants tended to be better educated. Their destination often was the interior of the United States. German immigrants also frequently traveled in families in groups more than the Irish did. As a result, much of their language and culture remained intact. In another comparison with the Irish, a greater number of German immigrants eventually returned to the country of origin in Europe. Heinrich Steinweg, known as Steinway, was a German immigrant who achieved fame in America for his quality of his musical instruments. Another example of a famed immigrant was Levi Strauss. He was a Jewish tailor who had traveled to California during the gold rush and made work pants that eventually became known as Levi's. 
German immigrants also established their own communities where they maintained many of their native traditions, such as beer halls. Other immigrants included British, Scandinavian, and Chinese immigration. During this time period, British citizens continued to immigrate to the United States, including professionals, independent farmers, and skilled workers. In 1869, Scandinavians numbered in excess of 70,000, and many Norwegians and Swedes moved to the farmlands and the prairies of the upper Mississippi River Valley, especially places like Minnesota. What are Swedes and Norwegians known as? Vikings, hence Minnesota Vikings. The Chinese also immigrated primarily to California, where the number would be about 35,000 by 1860. Mostly were only just male, called birds of passage, who would come here only to work in order to get enough money to go back home. Although the Chinese earned more money in America than was possible in China, whites kept them from doing many jobs. During recessions, mining and farming were two such jobs that were closed to them. As a result, many Chinese took the role of laundrymen. To top it off, in 1790, federal naturalization law even prevented them from becoming U.S. citizens. Nativism. Many of the new immigrants to the United States in the first half of the 19th century were Roman Catholic. This would arouse in the Protestant Americans a fear that the nation was to risk be converted to Catholicism. Unfounded as this would prove, it would create a surge in nativism, or the fear of things not American. Nativist or nativism favored the interests of culture, of native-born inhabitants, over those immigrants. This anti-immigrant measures of the 1840s and 1850s were spearheaded by descendants of immigrants from Britain and Northern Europe. They disliked the Irish, Catholics, African Americans, and recent immigrants. Much of their bias against the Irish immigrants in the middle of the 19th century was anti-Catholic in nature. A know-nothing cartoon, as you see here, shows that the Catholic Church supposedly attempting to control American religious and political life through Irish immigration. As nativism expanded, the influential political group known as the American Party, or the Know Nothing Party, formed and it spread. It was secretive and had members agree not to vote for Catholics or candidates born in the country. They got their name because if you asked them their candidate with their position on any topic, they said, I know nothing. I know nothing. Thinking by not taking a stand, I might help them get elected. So nativists began to target immigrants and Catholics and try to do whatever they could to keep them from becoming American citizens. Organized labor. In 1800, only 12% of the American workers worked for wages. By 1860, that had grown to 40%. This often came at the expense of skilled, self-employed artisans and craftsmen. It was very hard for them to compete with the lower prices for similar products made by factory links. For example, shoe shops were displaced by factories, and the master shoemaker would have become a manager rather than an artisan in a factory. In 1850, the Board of Health in Lynn, Massachusetts reported that the life expectancy of a shoe worker was 20 years shorter than that of a farmer. They would form skilled workers to respond to the competition with low price items to mass produce in factories, the first organization into trade associations. In order to help the cause of working people, labor organizations were created during this time period to the form of trade union labor politics. Guilds at first were workers organized into interest groups representing their individual skills or trades, similar to what had happened with the guilds of old Europe. These trade associations were the first types of labor unions warning the passage of the tariffs to protect their industry from foreign competition, but they did face major legal obstacles. In 1834, the National Trade Union was formed to organize local trade unions into a stronger national association. Women also would form trade unions, such as Sarah Monroe, who helped 
organize the New York Terrorist Society. The working men's political parties were also calling for laws to regulate banks and abolish the practice of imprisoning people who cannot pay their debts. They also call for free public education, supported with taxes to keep children in school and therefore not become a part of competition in the workforce and a 10 hour workday. When Philadelphia shoemakers went on strike in 1806, a court found them guilty of conspiracy to wage their wages. In the Supreme Court case of Commonwealth v. Hunt, 1846, the Massachusetts Supreme Court ruled that labor strikes were legal. In this case, that a trade union was not necessarily subject to laws against criminal conspiracies and that a strike could be used to force employers to hire only union members. The Rise of Professions before the 1820s, schooling in America was informal and haphazard. The first political demands for free tax supported schools originated with the working men's movement. It would take Horace Mann to emerge as a tireless champion for education reform in Massachusetts and other northern states. He stressed the need for state government to impose centralized control over schools and that all schools should have the similar standards. He promoted free public education to train children for citizenship. Just over half of the white children between ages five and 19 of age were enrolled in schools in 1850. School reform succeeded in large part because it appealed to the Northern middle classes. Teaching was the fastest growing of the new professions during this lifetime. What you see to the right is, comes from a McGuffey reader. Education was not also to teach children how to read and write, but also to teach morals and values. Law, medicine, and engineering. Teaching was often it was used as a stepping stone for young men who wished to study law. The young men would join as an apprentice for a couple of years in exchange for their laborers to learn law, since there are very few law schools in the United States. Healing of every strike assumed the title of doctor and most assisted physicians for several years while taking a handful of classes. By 1860, there were 60,000 self-styled physicians. A large number of them, however, were frauds or quacks, and the public thus exhibited a distrust of medical professions until the start of formal medical schools. The Industrial Revolution spurred the development of a new profession, that of the engineer. By the time of the Civil War, Engineering had become one of the most largest professions in the nation. Women's work. Although this was a period of scientific and political improvements, the role of females in the United States had not changed much. Women were still considered to be the primary caregiver in the home. However, more women began to seek a career in the male dominated professions. Just teaching and nursing, midwifery especially, were readily open to women. Religious and social service work were also options for women in the middle class. Elizabeth Blackwell of Ohio was the first woman to receive a medical degree. She began in the New York Infirmary for Women and Children. Her work as a professor of gynecology at the London School of Medicine for Women was also remarkable. At first, when she first entered her med school, there was shock. That shock would end when she'd end up graduating first in her class.